There we go, Kerry. The intro music's playing. Okay, <laughs> gets the heart pumping. The heart pumping. We're feeling good. Is day something? What day is it already? Day four. It's day our day four, four, but it's day three of the games. The okay. games that would have been. Uh, welcome everybody to the Cup of Life Cafe. If this is your first time, this is our virtual cafe, which we launched fifteen weeks ago. Kerry Potast has taken it over for two or seventeen days worth of gold medal and, and, and inspirational speakers that we've got coming in. Uh, Kerry, I'll hand over to Kerry very soon. Hi, Rob. Hi, Amanda. Hey, Nikki. Hey, Geordie. Hey, Mel. A bit romper ish there, Kerry, isn't it? <laughs> um, like what I do every day, I just want to make people aware. I'm just going to switch my camera over here. Hold on a second. Um, that we're raising funds for the Australian Sports Foundation. You would have seen it pop up in the office area. Now, the reason why we're raising funds for the Australian Sports Foundation is recently they did a survey for 70,000 clubs across Australia. And due to COVID, 16,000 of those clubs are in major issue. And in fact, many of those could be shutting down in the next sort of six months. So our remit here is to obviously inspire and motivate you. Um, but our other remit here is to make sure that you do make donations to the Australian Sports Foundation and support those local clubs, which most of them will blood, well, some of them will blood next the next Olympians in particular. Um, like what we do every morning, every afternoon as well and evening, um, please play nice. Please make sure you keep the chat room very active. Ask Elaine plenty of questions. Ask Andrew plenty of questions today. And the last thing is, is make sure that you do take a great screenshot today of all of us on the screen and share it across your social channels. We love to build more momentum around the athlete's story and what we're doing here. So please make sure that you do that. Kerry, I'm going to hand over to you, my friend. Oh, thank you, Luke. Well, how exciting it is again to be here with everybody tonight. And as you know, if this pandemic, this horrible pandemic hadn't have hit the world, we would have been in Tokyo, Tokyo 2020. And it would have been day three and there would have been a couple of new sports being um, competed with today. So first of all, surfing, first time in the Olympic Games, whoop, whoop, and then a new discipline for basketball, three-on-three -three basketball. So it's fitting that tonight we have a couple of, and I'm going to call them goats because all of you know what that means, greatest of all time, but goats in surfing and in basketball, please Bring on your cameras and your mics, guys. Please welcome the incredible Lane Beachley and Andrew Gaze. Big clap. Woo! Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> Thanks, guys. How are you going? How are you going first in Melbourne, Andrew? What's going on? Uh, I'm going really well. It's, uh, it's a difficult time, as you mentioned in the introduction. And uh, again, today we've had a, a nasty setback with 530 people testing positive to the the COVID, but um, but we're getting through it, and as long as we stick together, and probably most importantly, everyone wears their masks. There's been a few rebels out there trying to certainly make knuckleheads out of themselves, but um, but no, outside of that, it's it's been good. It's given me a lot of time to get out on the golf course and just really show how lousy I am at, at that sport as well. So it's um, <laughs> but outside of that, it's um, we're at home in lockdown and doing a lot of stuff online. Yeah, as you said, this is like your 55th um, <laughs> interview online. So this is going to be your 55th and your best. We well, know it's going to be an amazing I'll night. Try my thanks, hardest. Thanks for joining us. Lane, how are you going there in your trophy room? Welcome. Welcome to my trophy room. It's the perfect place to enter when you're having a self-pity party for one. <laughs> Look around and go, yeah, my life's been pretty good. I can't complain. Unlike Melbourne, Sydney, you know, we've we've had our fair share of challenges, but um, nothing like poor old Melbourne. I feel for you down there, Gazy, all that yeah. lockdown scenario. Uh, like good. you, though, I have attempted to get out of the golf course, um, but after four games, I promised my neighbours <laughs> who we play golf with that I would play four times and I'm done. Like, yes. get me off the freaking golf course. What yeah. a stupid game that is. But fortunately, the waves have been pumping the whole time during COVID, so this is the longest I've ever spent at home. Since 2007, I've been at home for over four months now and the waves have been firing. I bet you've been absolutely loving it. I know you live oh, on yes. the North beaches where I do and I know the waves have been pumping. I've been watching them. Yes. Um, Lane, seven-time world champion, you did have an eighth world title there but you said that you said they took that away from you yes yeah, so that i was declaring myself as an eight times world champion i mean I, I i went to the banquet and they handed me one of these 
world title cups. You know, this is my sixth one, but they handed me my eighth one that looked exactly like this and it had, well, not ASP, WSL Women's World Champion, Masters World Champion. Um, and so I started calling myself an eight times world champion. But then the CEO sent out this letter talking about my life and my career and um, and she kept referring to me as a seven times world champion. So I wrote a note back to her saying, am I a seven times world champion or an eight times world champion? And she said, well, we had a discussion around the WSL and we've decided that you're only a seven times world champion. Because the eighth one was literally just one event. You don't have to compete against... In whatever. Canada. You're an eight times world champion. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. I've said before to you, seven times, seven is a lucky number, so seven's yeah. good. I'll stick with um, that. Andrew, they can't take away any of your five Olympics. Five <laughs> Olympic Games. That's like over 25 years of, I don't know, and more of being at the top of your game. How? How How do you do that? How did you well, do that? And why? Yeah, because it's great fun and it, uh, it's an absolute privilege to have that opportunity to, to compete for your country and, when I was growing up, all my boyhood dreams were surrounded by uh, wanting to represent Australia and in particular go and compete at the Olympic Games. And primarily that was because of my dad's influence on me. Uh, my dad, he, he played in the 60s, 64 and 68 Olympics. Then he coached in 72, 76, 80 and 84 Olympics. And even prior to that, in uh, 1956, when the Olympic Games were held in Melbourne, uh, as most of us know there's the host city had, or the host nation can have a exhibition sport and in the 56 olympics they had australian rules football and when my dad was growing up he played basketball and australian rules football mostly in the amateurs or sometime in the association was with the melbourne football club for a, a real short period of time but he and his brother were also selected to play in that exhibition game of australian rules football in 1956 so in one way, shape or form, my dad went to eight consecutive Olympic Games. And for me as a youngster, uh, learning about the Olympics, the privilege of it is to represent your country, learning about the spirit of competition, the, the ideals of Olympism, all those things were instilled in me because of the communication I had with my dad, but also firsthand as a youngster, holding his hand and going to the airport to see him off to go compete for Australia. So they were always my uh, boyhood dreams, and, and fortunately for me, I, I had the good fortune to do it on five occasions. And I, and I say that legitimately. You do need a little bit of luck to go your way. And, and also, we're lucky being in Oceania because I look at some of these European nations and the challenges that they have had to qualify for the Olympics have been very difficult. So I've been blessed on a variety of fronts and just had the good fortune to, to take advantage of it. How is Lindsay going, by the way? He's doing okay. His eyesight's not too great. Unfortunately, he and his brother, uh, as I mentioned, who played in that 56 exhibition game of Australian Rules Football, were, well, and my uncle, he died uh, last week. So that was, oh. it's been a, it's a, it's a tough period for us. But uh, my dad's doing okay. His eyesight's not all that flash. So that's, his mind's great, which is, that's which is the most right. important thing. His, his body's packing up on him a little bit, but he, he's getting by. Good. You must, it just makes me think all those Olympic games, you guys must have so much Olympic memorabilia. Do you keep it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of the great regrets I, I had. When you're going through it, I mean, not that you ever take it for granted, but you, you, you're sort of focusing on the experiences. And I never really got too caught up in that all that Olympic memorabilia stuff. And even some of the outfits, it wasn't uh, until probably – Barcelona Olympics that I started to realise, hey, I might hang on to this because it has some value. My very first Olympic blazer was in 1984 and I still remember when I came home uh, from the Olympics, I, I, I took off the little pocket that had the coat of arms on it and and kept that, but I actually put the Olympic, that's the one, I put the Olympic blazer in the, the um, donation bin. And it went a full circle. No way. It was about 20 years later that my dad, he was still working at, in, for the uh, general manager of Basketball Victoria. Some bloke walked in and actually had my old Olympic jacket and was <laughs> it was, it had my name uh, embroidered on the inside and he picked it up at some op shop or something many, many years ago and he brought it back 
to see if I could sign it for him. So <laughs> I wish I had a hung on to a little bit more memorabilia, but uh, it's something. I've got bits and pieces, but not a lot. That is so cool. I remember having a garage sale I oh got years and years ago and I had one of my Olympic suitcases and I thought, oh, that's getting really old now. Just put that out there. And someone picked it up and went, oh, my God, this is amazing. And it was one of my neighbours down the road. She bought my Olympic suitcase. Yeah. Oh, it was just, yeah. I've still got my blazers and I've got my little badges for winning medals and participation and everything. So I thought I'd bring them out. This is the only time I ever get to bring them out, once every four oh, years, you know, for something special. So it's it fun. Yeah, it looks good. Hey, Lane, uh, look, we said before that you're on the Northern Beaches and you grew up in Manly. So I want to just go back to, like, when it all started for you when you were a young girl and you were out there in the water in Manly. <laughs> <laughs> we found this today. <laughs> That is you, right? That is me. It's one That's of the me. very few times I wore a bikini top. Yeah, look <laughs> at the style too. You, you've got it going on already. <laughs> and the muscles. Um, yeah. Lane, what was it like trying to get a ride out there with all those blokes? I know it was pretty hard. You had to push your way through a fair few boys out there. Uh, yes, it was a challenge. Um, you know, I got a ride to the beach with my dad or the bus or my skateboard, but getting a ride in the wa getting a wave with the boys was quite the challenge. You know, the guys uh, gave me a tough time and, you know, it wasn't a time. I started surfing in 76 and uh, there weren't any other girls out in the water. So um, it was an anomaly and the guys liked to give me stick, but it taught me to stand up and fight for what I wanted to do. And, and I ended up surrounding myself with guys who supported me you know all those challenges back then and surfing with people that didn't want me in the water it really taught me to start focusing my attention on people that did want me in the water and there's always a couple out there so you know how you say well I always say your tribe affects your vibe I found a really positive and influential tribe out there and managed to find a very supportive network of guys around me who became my tribe and and uh, I had to find new tribes as I, as I qualified my way up Manly Beach because south, the south corner is like primary school and then you work your way up to, to the end of high school up at Queenscliff. And so I graduated my way and, and found my little tribes as I went along the beach. And then what happens when you graduate from Queenscliff? Where do you go then? Just you hit Hawaii. the pro tour and start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know like through the first few years, the early years of like your competing and, and getting out on the world tour and really just honing your craft, you battled through quite a few um, health issues like chronic fatigue and depression and things like that. Can you just give us a bit of a picture of perhaps why that was happening to you and how you made it through that time? Well, as a kid, I wouldn't eat anything. So it was a real struggle for my dad to get any quality nutrition into me. I literally would go days on a Vegemite sandwich. And actually, when I went to high school in year 12, I was still taking Vegemite sandwiches to school for lunch. Like I just lived on white bread, butter and Vegemite. And uh, as a result of having a very poor diet as a kid, um, drinking way too many dairy products, you know, living on junk food as I got older, my poor nutritional habits led me down a very dark path to the point where I was lactose intolerant, but it was misdiagnosed as being influenza. And so then I was put on antibiotics quite regularly. So my, my immune system was completely trashed from by the time I was about 20 years of age. So I won my first event in 1993 after being on tour for three years. And then a week after I won my first event, I was diagnosed with my first bout of chronic fatigue syndrome. And I remember the first couple of years I went on tour, I mean, I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know what foods went with what. The first years I went on tour, I, could, I didn't have the money to eat out, but then I didn't know how to cook. So I was kind of stuck in this rock and a hard place. I remember going to France for the first time in 1991 and relying on frozen hamburgers and frozen pizzas to get me through because I had no idea what I was doing. And then fortunately the final year, is I, uh, not the final year, my third year on tour, I started traveling with a, a couple called Vanessa and Roger Osborne who, who ran a catering company, who owned a catering company, and they taught me the basic fundamentals of how to first choose what vegetables to eat, then how to chop them, and then what to cook them with. You know? <laughs> like I was just that clueless. Seriously. Wow. So and, clueless. That's when, and that's when you won your first title. How was that like? Winning your first title, did you know that you were ready for that? Did it just kind of happen or had you just built well, up to the point where you were ready? 
the first event I ever won, I had built up for years. You know, I'd, I'd been declaring since I was 15 that I was going to be a world champion surfer and then to win that first event as a 20-year-old substantiated my claims. Right, now I can beat... I can beat everyone in the world, so now it's time that I start thinking that I can be the best in the world. And winning that first event was, yeah, full of excitement. I was at, at complete disbelief, but then the next week my disbelief was was um, exacerbated by the fact that I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and had to go on a, quite a strict diet. But fortunately that first bout wasn't as debilitating as the second one. The second bout of chronic fatigue, which was about three years later, was the one that sent me into spirals and depths of depression and despair and, and I learnt the importance of diet and, and uh, nurturing my body, uh, nurturing my mind, my body and my spirit, not just through my diet, but I was getting up and training at 5.30 in the morning in the middle of winter and it was six degrees and the pouring rain and I had the flu and I just kept pushing, just kept pushing, just kept pushing. Sooner or later, you've got to listen to your body, right? If you want to go to five Olympics games, you've got to give yourself time to recover and the, the one thing that I've really learnt from that whole period was the body whispers before it screams. Got to start tuning into the whispers. Oh, totally, doesn't it? That just hits you like it makes you think about what's it whispering to me right now? How am I feeling? You know, I yeah. can feel my body whispering in my knees just standing here. <laughs> We'll tilt your pelvis just a little bit further forward to take the pressure off your knees. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay, done. <laughs> hey, hey, Andrew, you said before how, like, you, you grew up, obviously, with such an incredible um, mentor, your dad, you know, in your family. When did he first kind of put that basketball in your hands or did you just kind of, as soon as you got up on your feet, you walked over and you picked it up and you started the basketball? <laughs> it was absolutely literally as you, as you speak it. Um, and... My environment had a profound impact on me because when I was born, as I mentioned earlier, my dad was the general manager of the Victorian Basketball Associations and Association. And, and what that entailed um, was in the early 60s, or actually it was the late 50s, there was these three old army warehouse storage facilities in Albert Park. And what they, they were no longer required, the Commonwealth Army storage facilities they were no longer required uh, for that service uh, so they decided to allocate those three facilities to sport um, so in the late 50s they converted one of them to basketball one of them to badminton one of them to table tennis and subsequently they also built a squash uh, center right there in victoria and this we, uh, basketball converted it initially to a seven court basketball facility so now Six of those courts were undersized because they were just trying to pack these courts <laughs> in. And and this thing was an asbestos-ridden oh. joint that it was just <laughs> one of those old. Uh, but uh, basketball and their wisdom, when they were going through this conversion, they decided to build a manager's residence, which was lodged in between the badminton and the basketball. So from the time I was born to the time I was about 13, I lived in this manager's residence that was literally attached to this nine court basketball stadium so uh, my mum and dad have got photos of me like a week or so or, or, or uh, when I was born them carrying me around the basketball stadium when I was starting to learn to crawl that they'd have photos of me in the this uh, basketball stadium so I literally cannot recall a single day where I didn't know basketball because of that environment that I grew up in and it had a profound impact for me but the strange thing about it, when I'm asked the question about that privilege of living in that um, situation it was to me it wasn't just having access to basketball yeah that was significant but as I tell a lot of parents these days and what I tried to do with with my kids is that I had the opportunity to experiment with all those sports so I could play badminton, table tennis, squash at the back of the where we live was the old Harry Trot Oval, a football oval, so I could go out the back and have a kick of the footy. And right next to that was the Albert Park Golf Course, so I'd go out there and swing it. So I got to experiment with all these sports. And these days there's a, a real trend to get these prodigies when they're eight, nine years of age and, and bottle them up in the one sport and, and train, 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 train. And, and, yeah, that might be successful for many but or for some, but I think that you are far better off finding your own path but 
that diversity of all the different sports, I think, was a real key. Yeah, somehow I just can't see your almost seven foot frame being yeah. a, a, oh, a, a ten, table tennis player or badminton. Um, very, very <laughs> sharp with the table tennis. Very the agile. <laughs> yes, good reach. <laughs> To that point, Andrew, I actually played a lot of different sports too. You know, I was playing tennis and cricket and soccer and volleyball. Yeah, yeah. my frame wasn't really made for basketball and volleyball, but I played it anyway. Yeah. Um, but as you say, having that freedom to experience other sports, you get a feel for what it's like to play team sports versus individual sports, where you feel most comfortable, where you feel like you fit in and what you're most passionate about, and then you have the freedom to pursue it. So I feel that... Mm. I, I agree with um, with what you're suggesting there. It's giving the uh, giving kids the opportunity to play and have mm. some fun before it all gets too serious. Yeah, I love Correct. that. I mean, I've, I have a 14 year old, and he loves beach volleyball. He loves soccer. He's dropped pretty much everything else because he's starting to get good at both of them. But yeah, the having fun part. You just got to keep reminding them of that. So you were obviously yeah. having a lot of fun, Andrew. You made it. Um, to the Melbourne Tigers, and you stayed there for over 20 years with that club. Well, I want to ask yeah, you, were you ever tempted to leave? Like, were there people, like, giving you sort of underhand contracts saying, come play for us, come play for us? <laughs> well, it was actually my career started even before that because uh, with the Melbourne Tigers because I started to play with the Melbourne Tigers because they are one of the teams uh, back in the day that actually – had a junior program and a pathway that went from right from under 12s all the way into the senior ranks. So I actually started playing for the Melbourne Tigers when I was six. And I stopped <laughs> playing for the Melbourne Tigers when I at the senior level when I was 40. So, uh, and along the journey, there was a couple of times where I, I, I got some offers to, to go to uh, other different uh, Australian uh, elite clubs, but I did get the, the chance to, to go to and, and learn from other teams and other programs because I, I played in Italy, I played in Greece, I played with the Australian team where you get a lot of different coaching. Uh, I, I got a, I played college basketball at Seton Hall University. I spent a very, very short period of time in the NBA. So, yes, I was primarily uh, with the Melbourne Tigers, uh, but I did get those other experiences along the way. And for me, I, I guess I was... At a very early age, I, I was acutely aware that the opportunities and the progress that I was making through sport had a lot to do with the club that I was playing for and the coaching and the teaching that I was getting. And it wasn't until I was probably later on in life, like when I say later on in that development phase, when I was 18 or 19, did I ever envisage that you could ever be a professional in this sport. Uh, so when, I, when those opportunities did a, a, arise, I felt just incredibly indebted to the opportunities that I had as a youngster of playing with the club. So, and, and even to this day, I absolutely, without any other uh, motivation for saying this other than what I truly believe, is that I could live 10 lives over and I could still never repay the debt for what the Melbourne Tigers and the club did for me and the opportunities they provided me because without the par my parental influences and being involved in a, in a club that, that taught me the right way, educated me about the game and all the other aspects that go along with it, I would have had zero chance of having those experiences that I got to, to live through uh, later on in, in the elite level uh, basketball. So awesome to hear you know, top athletes really be grateful for everything that they were given along the way, you know, instead of either looking back and, you know, wishing they'd had more or whatever. You're so humble, Andrew. I love that about you. Uh, that is, no regrets. Andrew, there's, there's a question in the chat box from Narissa Turner saying, how did you go from playing with the Tigers to then being a Sydney King coach? Was that difficult? No, it wasn't because at that stage the, the Tigers were no longer in the NBL. The Tigers still exist and have an NBL one program, which is the next tier down from the NBL. So they, like a feeder. yeah, it is, it is. It's and it's becoming very much a developmental league. Although some of the associations and clubs, they're standalone clubs, and they're just trying to do their very best. They want to succeed at that level. But um, so I think I, I probably wouldn't have done it, and I probably um, uh, wouldn't have enjoyed it if I was actually had to compete against the Melbourne Tigers. So, <laughs> um, 
you know, I had a good friend in Lennart Coat was my assistant coach. The the guy that employed me there at um, uh, with the Sydney Kings, the, the general manager, his name is Jeff Van Gronigan. He was a a um, a former general manager of the Melbourne Tigers. So it was it was really easy and absolutely loved that experience of going to have the opportunity to coach uh, with the Sydney Kings. That's cool. So cool. And Lane, what about you? Like two decades, two decades on the world tour, obviously committed to, you know, honing your craft. Um, what was probably one of the most memorable or special world titles out of all your seven world titles? Which one do you savour the most? <laughs> which is your favourite child? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which one do I savour the most? You know, every one of them holds a really special place in my heart and in my memory. The first one, of course, was probably the most impactful because I'd been declaring to the world for a good 15 years that I was going to be a world champion. So I feel like my peers were as excited for me as I was because they were thinking, finally, she's going to shut the fuck up about it. Now. <laughs> we can get on with it. Um, but, of course, I became addicted to winning two, three. See, I say that I won seven world titles and five of them in a state of fear. And what I mean by that is number one and number seven, I was in love with the process. I was in love with the opportunity. I was in love with learning and growing and I wasn't in a controlled fixed mindset. Whereas number two, three, four, five and six, I was in a fear-based state. I just, it was at, at all costs, I must do this. So as, as proud as I am of being the only surfer in the world to have won six consecutive world titles, I'm not very proud of the way in which I went about it. So I'd say number one is the is definitely the most memorable and number seven is probably the most special because it's amazing how we go through our lives in a very particular way about how we feel we're meant to compete and how we're meant to win and we learn our lessons and we stay true to what we know. Coming back to win my seventh world title after a near life-threatening, well, it was a life-threatening neck injury. I had a wave that was six feet above my head, land on the back of my neck and herniated a disc. I ignored the pain. The body was went from whispering to screaming and I still ignored the screams because I was on this relentless pursuit of success and winning because my whole self sense of self-worth and identity was wrapped up in being the most successful surfer in history. That when I got there after winning my sixth one, I went, oh, I can relax a little bit now and then my body started falling apart. So I had to take about six months out of the water and when I came back to compete and win my seventh world title, I did it in a state of ease, grace and gratitude. I did it in a state of, wow, I'm just so grateful that I can surf without pain. I'm so grateful that at 36 years of age, I'm still able to keep up with these teenagers. I'm grateful that I get paid still to travel the world and surf for a living because, you know, the real life is coming pretty soon. And uh, sitting in the water and, um, and just recognizing everything that was going on, just immersing myself in the whole experience as opposed to putting the blinders on and being really fiercely driven taught me a lot about how you can learn to do things differently if you open yourself up to it. So to answer your question in a very roundabout way, I feel like my seventh one was definitely the most special. Yeah, that's incredible. Such a and it's such a journey through to like I guess mindfulness, a mindfulness swim. Very mindful. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a heartfelt heartfelt win okay you must have you must have also like you said been smacked by some of these biggest waves we've got a little i don't know if cookie can show this we've got a little video of one of your waves yes. oh yeah this one i survived yes. it doesn't have I was, sound i don't think but we so I, we can talk over it but yeah i was the first woman to be invited to go and surf this wave this is called owls it's off the cliff face of at botany bay off Cornell. It's a place called Owls that's kind of owned by or run or managed by the Bra Boys. And I remember when I when I got towed into it, and I think we're gonna you're gonna see it repeated in a slow motion state. But when the jet ski drove me into that wave like this, yeah, I had to negotiate my way around the guys in the lineup, and then they are all looking over because you can see the wave stretching out well and ahead of me. And I thought, right here, I'm too deep and I'm dead. And then I just thought, oh, I'll just stand <laughs> up and enjoy the enjoy the view. And then if you see right under my board, the whitewash ball comes up underneath me. Normally that throws you off the wave, but I was just so relaxed. I was so surrendered to the fact I was going to die that day. that I went, oh, I'll just enjoy it. Keep my eyes on the exit. 
surfing is a great analogy for life. Where you look is where you go. Kept my eyes up, kept looking at the exit, got spat out. And everyone around me was celebrating the fact that they didn't have to peel me off the rocks and call an ambulance. And so I thought, okay, that must have been pretty special. So I put my board in the back in the, back of the boat and went, all right, I'm done. My work is done. I'm out. <laughs> and I've never been back. Perfect. Four yeah. months gone, done, finished. I mean, you know what? Um, surfing that way, because it's so notoriously dangerous, it comes in from deep water, it breaks on a barnacle covered slab of rock, and then it breaks into a cliff face. So there's very little room for error. Surfing that wave and having that wave beamed out around the world earned me more recognition and props from my peers than winning seven world titles. Like mm. the guys were just amped on that. Wow. Isn't and the night before, cool. I was in an Alex Perry gown at the In Style <laughs> Women of Style Awards accepting an award on stage alongside Sarah Murdoch for my uh, work in charity. Um, and the next day, I'm donning my Oakley wetsuit and paddling out into death-defying waves off Cornell. That, the is, duality so, of that is so cool. The life of a, a very famous, well-known, but still incredibly talented athlete. Um, <laughs> And that is back to you now, Andrew, speaking of you. <laughs> you yes. mentioned that you had a, a short career overseas. You were with the Antonio, um, San Antonio Spurs and you actually, your team did win a premiership. So you do have a ring, right? Yeah, I do. It's something that um, I've never worn. I, I, I put it in the, the trophy cabinet and it's, um, get asked oh. about the ring quite a bit, but it's, it's spectacular and it's, it's incredible the resources the NBA has and the uh, the amount of money they spend on the trophies. Well, to me anyway, it was extraordinary. And the great thing about it is when they honour you, each of the players that were involved in, in the win get one of their these rings. But, but they also recognise the extended family as well. And you see the top of that ring right there. When I, when I got my ring, they also presented my wife with a pendant with exactly the same, with all those diamonds around it, they presented her with a, a, a pendant of um, the top of that ring as well. And they, they, um, they acknowledged the fact that, that in order for the athletes to perform to their best, that they, they need their support staff around them and the, the significant others. And, and they want to make sure that they feel very much a part of the championship as well. And, you know, I, my role was virtually insignificant. Uh, it, it was one where um, I, it was a privilege to be there. I enjoyed my time there, but my contribution on the floor was, like I said, it was absolutely in insignificant. But to, to, to go through that experience and to be part of the team and, and, and play your role as minor as it is, it's, it's just a, it was a real joy. And at the stage of my career too, because it was, it happened a lot later in my, my life. I, I spent a little bit of time with the Washington Bullets. They're now called the Wizards, but with the Washington Bullets in the early 90s. But that was only for a, like a month. And I thought that was it with, for my NBA experience. But uh, to, to be in the right place at the right time and to, to go through that journey, journey was something real that, um, although I don't gloat about it because I understand that uh, it, it wasn't necessarily something where I did all that did did anything really on the floor, but um, <laughs> but to be there was to still, get there. It's the still getting there though. You really, couldn't get there without exactly. really you grateful. Know. Yeah, you earned your way there. And the thing is, people don't remember how you won; they remember that you did. I know. Well, I, I, I take, um, it. take it, Andrew. Take it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I do get a little embarrassed because sometimes a lot of people talk it up, and and it is. I'm not trying to downplay it, and I was there, and it, absolutely a great privilege, but. It's yeah, I I, um, I get a little embarrassed sometimes when people start talking about this as some sort of terrific achievement because um, I didn't really do too much when I was there. But you well, owned your way there. That's I it. Think, I think there was a there was an embarrassing moment there that I actually read about. <laughs> we that involved some like heat cream or something. Well, that was no, that was when I was with the, the wizards with the oh, Washington was it? wizards. Yeah, that was that was in my, my my first go around because when I arrived at the Wizards, I was there and um, um, they put you through these tests. And when you're a youngster, and and it was towards the end of the season, I got called in late to the season, and you, you go there and you you're trying to impress them with all the you, you know your strength. And I didn't have a whole lot of it; it wasn't really my strength. But I they do these leg leg presses, 
and on there and I'm pounding away and just using every ounce. And it was really stupid in hindsight because they didn't really care if you leave. They want to know whether you put the ball in the hole. They want to know if you pass the ball. But, you know, at those types of elements, you're just trying to, to, to uh, show that you can you can be you belong. And the next day I couldn't I could hardly walk. I mean <laughs> that my legs were that I mean I have never experienced that type of pain. So that the physio there they gave me they gave me some some this it's called flexal flexal heat cream and they said it was pretty potent and before the, our first game that I was playing I was in there and they they rub it on they said that you got to be real careful uh, with it because if you can get it other past your body, you know, it's, it can get uh, a little uncomfortable. And and I was really nervous. And part of my ritual was I always used to go to the toilet before every game, just before you you go in for the last coach's address. You go and make sure you relieve. You use the facilities and make sure you relieve yourself. And I went in there, tidied myself up, and I, and I must have had just a little bit on my the back of my hand or something. And as I was. Uh, taking care of stuff with the toilet paper, just on my my ass cheeks, just a little bit of that flexal was there. So <laughs> I've, I've come straight out and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I can feel me this burning sensation on me around my ass, and I'm there, and and, and 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 you know when you get feel really hot, you start to sweat, and I'm there, and the the coach is giving us a dress, and I'm and they might they, everyone's. Must be looking at me going, what the hell is wrong with this bloke? He's a bit nerd, you know. It's only a game we're going to go into. And I mean, it's full ladder. And then uh, after the, the, the address, I, I literally had to go, go to the toilet, get some water, and try and clean it all off because it was that hot and it was that uncomfortable that it made for a, uh, a tough opening night experience. Yeah. Andrew, it's just like the curry that we've got here in the cafe, mate. It, it's good. Oh, hey, hey, that, well, that, that gets when you do, and I'm not a big curry man, and that'll that'll get you sweating. And it's the same type of experience when you're there, and just you, 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 it's just that heat that's generating. I don't know whether it's psychologically or whatever, but your 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 body mechanisms start kicking in, and I'm in a full ladder before I even step foot out in the, the warm up floor. So, boys and girls, if you're watching this, just be very <laughs> careful with heat cream. Oh, yes. It's Flexor. <laughs> I forget. I remember the name. It was like Flexor or something like uh, it's something along those lines. So, it was, it was, it's a, it's an exaggerated version of deep heat. Yeah. Very exaggerated. Now, we're going to go to the Olympics. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll fast forward. And, Lane, I know that, you know, you, you're not an Olympian as such, but you actually have been to the Olympics. A very special moment for you. You're in London as one of the mentors um, with a couple of other special mentors right there. How was that experience? It's one of the highlights of my life, Kerry, just having an access all areas pass to the London Olympic Games. Yeah. And and the honour of being asked to mentor the best athletes in Australia who are representing the country on a world stage. I mean, it was just extraordinary. So it was a, a pinch me is this real moment sitting there with Steve Waugh and Laurie Lawrence always with his five, five alive, five alive. <laughs> um, and John Eels and Kieran Perkins and myself. It was just such an extraordinary experience. And basketball was one of my sports, Gazy. And yeah. I remember... I. I I had no idea who the players were. You know, I, I didn't do, like Kerry has, I didn't do much research. I thought I'll just figure it out when I get there. And I get into, I'm in the um, the village, you know, about 10 days before all the athletes come in. And I've been shipped around to other satellite um, sites where other sports are warming up, like Belfast with boxing and the athletics crew. Anyway, the basketball team moves on into the village and I see someone hanging a Australian flag over their balcony and then there's an Aboriginal flag coming over the balcony as well. I was like, what's going on up there? And, and one of the boys said, oh, that's just Patty Mills. And I'm like, Patty Mills, bring yourself to the balcony. <laughs> Expose yourself. No, not that way. Just, <laughs> just like, what's going on up there? Um, and it was just a matter of just treating them like human beings and then, of course, investing myself into that experience. I literally just did everything I could possibly do to put myself into the footsteps of the athletes. As I said, you know, as you clearly know, I'm not an Olympian, but my role there was to help the athletes get the best out of themselves in an environment that has filled with enormous amounts of pressure and expectations. So 
I, um, I took that role very seriously. I loved every minute of it. I cherish the friendships that I, that I have generated from that experience and just I'm so grateful to, um, you know, John Coates and, and Nick Green and the whole Australian Olympic Committee for presenting me with the opportunity to support the, the athletes through that process. And I'm sure that they were pretty grateful to have you there as well. And it's oh, so good to talk fun. to athletes who have succeeded in other sports because it's just a different perspective, different experience and different stories to draw on. And, Andrew, I, look, I, I probably can guess one of your most memorable moments of the five Olympics would have been the beginning of the Sydney Games. Would yeah. that be pretty memorable? Yeah, oh. incredible. It was um an amazing honour and you see the flag there and just if you look at my left arm and just to the left of there is John Coates and he's the man that gave me the honour to be the captain of the Australian team and and, and one of the um, ceremonial activities in, included uh, carrying the flag and introducing some of the greatest athletes this country can produce to the rest of the world and of course to to do that in your in your home country with your fans surrounded by your family and friends and the Australian family, larger family as well, was uh, just just incredible. And um, to, to step foot out in front of 120,000 people at Stadium Australia and just to hear that roar and the way in which the the whole nation was behind these games and uh, just an incredible experience and, and one that I often – think back of it and think was, was that some did I did I actually dream was that some sort of fanciful dream or did that really happen <laughs> because it was just such a an incredible experience to have it went so fast I guess too and was the flag pretty heavy no well it, they give you a harness oh. for the you have this harness that it goes in but that that pole that never touched the touch the harness the for one single second <laughs> Oh, it was, you know how you to hear about these people that grow in the emotion of situations, they get these extraordinary powers. Well, I think I was yes. one of those where it was just like I had that flag and I was waving it around and it didn't feel heavy, uh, in, in, not for one single second. And it was um, just get caught up in the emotion, very little instruction about what you're supposed to do. Coachy, all he said was um, just go out there and have some fun and, and that's what we tried to do, and it's uh, you, you sort of have to check yourself because when you walk out there and that roar of the the, um, the fans, and, and when they're your fans, and there's that big break because you're the host nation, and they've had to sit through 215 to 30 odd other nations or however, how many have been um, announced, and then they have that big break, and then finally the host nation is uh, is introduced just. Uh, incredible noise that, that that is generated and the emotion around that. And uh, I remember the first 100 metres down there just waving it and trying to soak it all up and and looking back and actually looking back and thinking, shit, I'm, I'm about 70 metres in front of the rest of the field here. I need to just, <laughs> just put it back into second gear a little bit here just to make sure it's not quite all about me. And, um, <laughs> but it was... You know why you're so far in front is because we were all behind you and we wanted to go out in single file because they were trying to bunch us together, but we wanted to be close to the like the edge of the track so we could see all the people in the crowd, not in the middle where we couldn't see people. So yeah. we came out with dribs and drabs, and so I think the whole track was just filled with us at once. <laughs> yeah, they say spread out and it's changed. And they it's pretty much open slather these days. But I remember my first uh, Olympics back in 1984, the general protocol was that women at the front and then followed by the men, and it was supposed to be in try to be in relative order of height. <laughs> and so we were always stone cold motherly, all the basketball, all the, you know, the, the, the big guys, the volleyballers and the basketballers, we were always uh, last out. But uh, on this one, it was something special to be first out and just to have that honour and the recognition that uh, was provided for me and uh, – I am, again, acutely aware, it gets back to what we first started, the, one of the most significant reasons why I was given that honour wasn't just because of my achievements, because of my dad and, and his contribution as well. So, um, you know, although I was there for me, it was very much me, my parents, and in particular my dad because of his participation in the Olympics and, and then the sport, to have the sport on it in this way, as well was um was something incredible 
Pretty, pretty special. So speaking of the sport, three on three. Did you think you'd ever see three on three at the games? Give us a little bit of a indication of what that's, how different is that going to be? And do the guys that play the real mm. basketball, because that's what we say about volleyball, you know, yes. different. Um, yeah. how do they feel about the three on three? Or are they all lining up to play and qualify? No, no. Well, you, <laughs> everyone's absolutely embraced it. Um, and and it's it's evolving. And it's one of those ones that's been around for a while. In uh, It's been at the Youth Olympics for quite some time and one of the major sports at the, the Youth Olympics as well. And every single person that comes through and plays basketball, uh, it is fundamental to most training routines is you'll play three-on-three -three basketball. And the evolution of that is that there's been – a lot of grassroots three-on-three -three basketball tournaments. And these tournaments then grew to where FIBA started to embracing it. And and then, of course, uh, more recently been announced as, as an Olympic sport. Uh, I think it has a, a very good comparison to what volleyball has done with beach volleyball. Uh, but it is still applies many of the same principles of, as the main game. Uh, it, well, I shouldn't say the main game, the five-on-five five game, um, and it and it's um, it's becoming a, it's a sport in its own right with with certain specialties. Now, uh, I don't know what it is like in in, in beach volleyball. There are specialties to it, hmm. but great basketball players that play the five-on-five five game will still be great three-on-three three players. Now, that that may not be the case in in something like beach but beach volleyball, but the way they are utilising it, the, the criteria for entry into the Olympics is not just winning. It's about how your nation promotes three-on-three -three basketball as they try to evolve it. You, you've got these uh, rankings that you have to adhere to, to one where if we were just doing it the same way as we did the five-on-five -five basketball, we would have very little problems qualifying. But my understanding is our, our, our women's team will qualify our men's team won't qualify because of we haven't met some of the other criteria. So it's um uh it's not as it's not as refined as yet as beach volleyball as such, but it is a it's the perfect analogy for how this is going. And I think it's fantastic. It's quick, it's super physical, and a lot of people are critical of the Olympics introducing uh, some of these other sports, but it, for the Olympics to survive and I think for these other sports to, to get that appreciation, I am not one of those. I, I am all for what the Olympic movement is doing to stay modern, to stay relevant and to, to keep people engaged. This And three-on-three -three basketball falls into that category. Yeah, well said, well said. And, Lane, how are our girls doing? How are they looking for Tokyo next year? They were They were looking pretty good this year. You think they can hold on? They were looking so good for this year. I know Steph Gilmore was pretty pumped and Sally, it's her, just her dream. You know, she was originally probably going to be an Olympic runner and we stole her from the wow. athletics track and put her in the put her at the beach where she belongs. So the girls, I know once, um, once the lockdown started, everyone was feeling a little bit unsettled and uncertain. All of our qualifications are still provisional because uh, of the ISA's ruling with the IOC that they have to still compete in the 20, or well, what was going to be the 2020 ISA World Games. So as long as those, I, I don't know what the qualification process now entails, but in saying that, they're, they're confident that they'll still qualify, they're confident that they'll compete to the best of their ability, and I'm confident that we have the high performance program and the support network in this country through Surfing Australia to ensure that we come home with a couple of gold medals. Yeah, so the boys obviously right up there as well. Yeah, with Owen and Julian and Sally and Steph, my goodness, we've got one of the strongest teams any any uh, country can can field. So yeah, I think we're looking pretty good. But well, what's the what's the likelihood of Tokyo twenty twenty one? Yeah, it's going to be on. It is going okay. to be on. Let's put How's it out there to the world. <laughs> it's going to be on. And look, all the athletes out there that are watching, that's what we have to focus on. That's what you have to focus on, that it is on. As soon as you start to misdirect your focus and you start thinking about all the what-ifs in anything in life, 
you know, that's when you yes. just can't perform or you can't do what you have to do. Yes, hey, we, I, there is something about you two that I found out today that you have in common, Ooh. believe it or not. Not our stature. <laughs> not our stature, but we've got a little video that I think it's a good time to play to just show. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, oh. oh yes. Have a look at that. Very nice. Look at that rhythm. See the rest of that. I try to find you, Lane. You've both been on Dancing with the Stars. All I could find is a a picture. All I could find is a picture because I reckon that you've actually gone and deleted everything from the internet. <laughs> yep, yep. It scarred my mind and my memories. But uh, <laughs> did you enjoy it, Andrew? I, I did. I, I was a reluctant participant. They tried to get me yep. on the very first one. Uh, and I declined. And James Tonkins, another great uh, athlete, I think oh, yeah. he was on the very first one. But no, it was, it was a lot of fun. Anthony Kudafidis won. My Tamsin Lewis was another competitor. And um, one of the things, that, and the, the uh, claim to fame that I uh, get out of Dancing with the Stars is that I actually defeated Thor because <laughs> because Chris Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth was on my series of um, Dancing with the Stars, this is back when he was on Home and Away or, or one of those um, those soap opera shows, the yep. Australian ones, and he was on it and a ripping, ripping fella, but um, he's bulked up a little bit since then. We used to sit, <laughs> me and Chris Hemsworth, we, we became, and, and, and uh, Cooter, we were all pretty friendly, and me and Chris Hemsworth back then, and then he had a fair chassis on him back then. I mean, he, he was okay, but nothing like he is now. We used to just sit there and just marvel at Anthony Kudafidi's body. It was just <laughs> this guy that looked like he was chiselled out of marble. And um, and and yeah, had the good. Tra- he came fifth, and I uh, I got booted out the following week, uh, and, and I came fourth. Where, how far did you get into it? Mate? I I lost in right in the middle. I got I was booted yeah. out week five. But you know what? I learned something really valuable from doing that program. Uh, well, actually, I learned quite a few valuable things. Number one, don't have a fight with the judges because you're no. always going to lose. So. <laughs> no. Number two, uh, and this is the most valuable thing, is it taught me the uh, the subtleties of self-sabotage <laughs> because no matter how much work, the I mean, how many hours of dance training would you do every week before walking out of the dance floor? Like 20 hours, 25 hours? Absolutely. Uh, that, yeah. when, 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 they, when they asked me to do it, they yeah. said, listen, you could probably get away with it somewhere about, about 10 hours a week practice. Now, yeah. having gone through it, Barishnikov couldn't have got – I mean, he, he, he could not have done 10 hours. It is very labour-intensive. Very. So I would do 25 hours of <gasps> dance training every week. Yeah, uh, at I, least. I treated, this was my first um, post-surfing thing. You know, this was mm. – I'd set this goal for the, probably the first six years in retirement that I would do something physical every year. So I retired in 2008, 2009, Dancing with the Stars. Mm. And I invested in myself into this like it was a legitimate competition. I didn't realise it was a popularity contest. So (laughs) I did all of this dance training and then I'd walk out onto the dance floor and I would get this overwhelming sense of anxiety and nervousness because all of a sudden I'd be distracted by the lights, the cameras, the judges, the audience. I'd think about everyone at home and I'd think, oh, shit. Yep. I think that you think that I think I'm a good dancer and I don't want you to think I'm any better than how you're going to see I am because I'm yep. not that good. And you <laughs> can't think that I'm any better than what I am. So to prevent mm. you from thinking that, I'm going to subconsciously sabotage my performance so you don't think I'm any better than what I am. Yes. Well, I reckon <laughs> I, I reckon I did, uh, I think we did about 11 or 12 different routines yep. and every single one of them at practice no problem, got through it. I don't think, not on one single routine, 
did I get through as we rehearsed the whole time, <laughs> oh, the whole way? Not a one. I remember one that I had to do this lift, and you had to have your left hand under your right hand. I pick up Linda and my partner, and I had to pull her up and throw her somewhere. And I remember <laughs> going down, and I had my hand, my right. I got confused, and like you say, the lights and the had it around like oh, this. No. And I looked down there, and she is at the top of her voice screaming, "No!" <laughs> like she is. And, uh, and and so we sort of bluff our way through it. And to me, I'm thinking, this looks like an absolute mess. When you look back and you could just sort of keep moving and you do shit, it actually didn't look as bad as it felt at the time. But straight after she said, if you had it pulled me up with that, you would have broke my neck. I'm like, I'm like oh, shit. Oh. So it was, um, yeah, some scary moments in it. But it was good fun. I, I really enjoyed it. It was good fun, uh, yeah. They, absolutely they attempted classic. to... Absolutely. I was asked to go, but my knees are just so, so bad that I don't think I could do oh, one hour. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Good excuse. Yeah. Hey, um, did we you have a dry it. backstage, Daisy? I have a what? We, did you, was your backstage dry or were you allowed to drink between? No, uh, the few of them had a few, a few beverages. They, they would um, sort of get a few looseners to, just to, to get them through, but not a lot. It wasn't excessive by. Uh, yeah. 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 Loosen up a bit. Yeah. Hey guys, we could talk all night. There's, there's just a couple. Haven't of... we already? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I told you it was only going to be thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, we've got this rap, this rapid fire question thing. It's pretty fun. So we've got sixty seconds on the clock. Uh, Andrew, why don't you go first? Okay, sure. Are you ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Hey, funniest thing that's ever happened to you in the village? Just one word or two. Funniest things ever happened to me? Oh, jeez. Too hard. Hard. Too hard, yeah. Okay. Did they ever make the beds long enough for you in the village? Yes, they did. <laughs> they, were, they were temporary made, but they did extend and put some uh, stools and stuff at the end. Do you think you would have been a good surfer? <laughs> I am. I was a surfer. Kerford Road Pierce. Down in the bay. Bay waves were my go and I'd just wander down. No good. But, but yeah, I used to surf a little bit. Would you rather be the best player in the worst team or the worst player in the best team? I would rather be the... He's experienced both. N I have. <laughs> Neither. I would rather be in the best team. Good. If you had your time again but you couldn't play basketball, what would you play? I'd play Australian rules football. Love it. Oh, of course. Who's the most famous person you've ever met? I met Michael Jordan. Oh, I was just going to ask. The last question was, have you watched, obviously, The Last the last, the last, last Dance? What did you think? I thought I loved every single frame of it. It was – I appreciate the narrative that was being created because it was produced in part by Michael Jordan. So it was, it was slanted, but it was still just a fantastic uh, documentary, great insight, and I enjoyed it. You know what I enjoyed most? Sitting down with my son, who's just turned 19, but he wasn't around in that era – but I've heard a lot about Michael Jordan. But just educating him on the greatness, which was Michael Jordan, and to see him get that experience to, to watch it was fantastic. I would have loved to have been in the living room with you when you were talking about all the stuff too. That would have been very cool. Okay, Lane, cool. 60 seconds. Yep. You ready? Okay. Yep. Yes. Do you sleep much the night before your finals? Yeah, absolutely. I slept like a baby. What do you dream of, standing on the podium with the champagne or riding that perfect wave? Just getting to the beach on time. <laughs> Would you trade one of your world titles for anything? No. <laughs> Does your husband, Kirk, sing in the shower? Sorry? Does your husband, Kirk, sing in the shower? Oh, yeah, that'd be fun. He sings all day long, yes. Yeah. He's always singing. Your favourite book about mindset? The inner athlete. If you didn't play, if you didn't surf, what sport would you play? Tennis. What's your unique superpower? X-ray vision. I can see through anything. I'm a, actually my secret power is a bullshit barometer. <laughs> ah. <laughs> How many surfboards did you used to travel with? I used to travel to Hawaii with about sixteen, and I used to travel what? with the six, and I now nice. own one hundred and three. Oh. <laughs> where do you put them? What do you, where do you store them? I have two different garages. I have about seven, 60 odd down at my dad's garage and there's almost 40 in this garage here at home. Jeez. So how do you decide which one you take out each day? 
Um, I look at the conditions and then I visualize what kind of experience I want to have, you know, whether it's paddling or whether it's um, maneuverability and then the size of the swell. And so, you know, the conditions dictate the boards that I choose. But I do have a variety of boards in very similar um, technicalities or similar shape and size that I can choose from just by knowing the idiosyncrasies of each board. Amazing. It's technical. Amazing. It's not like picking up a ball and throwing it over a net, you know, or mm. throwing it through a hoop. There's, there's a lot of different <laughs> variances, nuances in each board. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, Cookie, you want to come back in? We're just going to see if there's any questions that we haven't answered that um, anything specific. Yeah, there's plenty of questions, plenty of questions. Uh, can I just say, that was so funny. That was awesome. Well done. <laughs> that was brilliant. Thanks. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I oh, know I'm just giving you all, all totes. Um, this one's from for you, Lane, from Megan. Um, any recommendation yep. for beginner surf board, boards for adults as I'd like to start surfing and unsure of what board to get? Funny. Yeah, definitely get a soft top. If you want to learn how to surf, go to a surf school and at least learn the basic fundamentals first before you just grab any kind of board and take yourself out there because it's a lot harder than we make it look. Go to a surf school, learn just the fundamental principles around what boards to ride, what way to face, <laughs> how to get up, where to look. And then, yeah, start on a foamy, start on a soft top. It's not always good to go too long. Um, if you're about my height, I'm 5'5", five five, so I would prefer to ride around the 7'6". If you're Andrew's height, how tall are you, Gazy? I am uh, 201, which is 6'7". Okay, so you'd be on a 9-foot board minimum. So, Kez, yeah. how tall are you? <laughs> I'm 6 foot and half an inch. <laughs> Take that half. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, always start on a soft top. But, and, right. and you can always get advice from a uh, from a surf shop too as well. Right. Uh, over to you, Andrew, uh, from Caroline. Uh, what advice would you give young basketballers about achieving their dreams of playing for their country at the Olympics? Uh, I guess in going back to, to what Lane was just saying is that it's important at a, at a, at a young age, uh, one, like I said before, experiment with all different sports because it really helps your motor skills and, and, and get all that um, all, all the, the different experiences really helps you. But I think um, getting the fundamentals, your fundamentals are so important and the game will become a lot easier if you, from a very early age, you just learn some of the, the basics. And you can have your own sort of style to that, but there are certain fundamentals that are really non-negotiables in regards to getting better. Mm. So if you do that, and, and I think... Um, uh, Secondly, it, it, it is it's it's time consuming, mm. so if you, you've got to have a real passion for it and a love for it because the amount of hours that you're going to have to put in, it, it, it's a lot. So um, don't don't pressure yourself. Just know it. You you'll know within whether you love it enough to, to dedicate the the amount of hours that it needs to be. But don't um you know don't knock yourself out if you if you're not an Olympian in in, in a year and a half, it takes a long, long time to um, to get there. Yeah, it comes down to being realistic with your expectations, doesn't it? Like, yeah. I mean, your, your values and your work ethic will determine whether you achieve your goals. But, I mean, there's a lot of other nuances and variables that determine whether we win or lose. But uh, if you're willing to put in the work um, and that you've surrounded yourself with great people then and you can detach from the outcome and continue to follow due process, then you're giving yourself the best opportunity. So incredible. I'm going to stick with you on this one. As a pioneer of women, uh, women in surfing and now surfing being an Olympic sport, are you disappointed from a personal perspective that you can't compete or is it something that you're just proud of all your achievements and you're excited for the girls? If you could cryogenically freeze me and keep me back to when I was about 35, I'd still want to compete, but now I'm closer to 50. Um, and a lot of the girls who were on tour weren't even born when I was competing, so I have no qualms about not missing out on the Olympic Games. I'm just really proud that the foundation that I've laid for the future generation, that they are benefiting from, benefiting from it. I'm really excited for women surfing to be included in the Olympic Games. I mean, I'm so excited that women surfing was the first sport to, to announce pay equity. Um, and I'm just really grateful that all of the battles that I had in the boardroom and at the beach have amounted to this. You know, I'd be disappointed 
if women surfing wasn't offered the same opportunities that they're offered today because then I feel like everything that I battled through amounted to nothing. So to see the likes of Sally Fitzgibbons and, and Stephanie Gilmore have the opportunity to go and represent Australia on the world stage in the biggest sporting uh, competition in the world uh, fills me with immense pride and satisfaction. And, and I will be there, you know, uh, cheering them on as, as president of Surfing Australia. So that fills me with pride and satisfaction as well. So good. Last question for both of you. Um, this is from Cynthia, Lane and Andrew. The longevity of both of your careers is incredible. The fierceness and competitiveness of young athletes nowadays coupled with advancements in technology have accelerated how quickly they are improving. improving. Do you have any advice slash insights on how athletes at the top of their fields can continue improving or hope to improve for as many years as you both have? I'll, over to you, Andrew, first. Yeah, well, well I think in a sport like basketball it's it's very physically demanding and you do need a little bit of luck to have the longevity that, that I had but again when you think about those fundamentals to longevity it's as simple as a love of the game and a fun in the process and enjoying the the, the grind um, and and sometimes that grind can make people say well I've had enough and that's that's Fair enough. But when you actually love that and, in, and embrace those challenges and you, you're having fun with the experience, you don't get so caught up in, in the, the result. You know, most people are looking at the, 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 the win or the loss. That takes care of itself. It's mm -hmm. the process that ultimately will determine the outcome. And sometimes the process is, is more rewarding than the outcome. So it's that 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 win is very fleeting. That loss is very fleeting. Um, it's painful at the time when you lose, and it's very joyful and euphoric when you win. But that that sort of goes away pretty quickly. Mm. But it's that other stuff that you really have to embrace. And and if you don't have that, there's been many super super talented individuals that got that gifted DNA that die out pretty quickly, not because they're not skillful enough or, or that they um, uh, can't perform to a high level, but they lose that desire that it's no longer fun and they want to do other things. Yeah. Okay. Lane, for you. So, well, to contribute to what the wonderful commentary Andrew's already given us, I think the one thing that really contributed to my longevity was having a hobby or a passion or a life outside of surfing because it, it gave me a healthy distraction. We can become so consumed by our sporting endeavours that it becomes a job and then it becomes laborious and it becomes mm. exhausting and it drains us of our resources and our energy and our passion. So as much as I'd love to compete and I love to travel and I love to surf, it was also really refreshing for me to immerse myself in something as far from surfing as I possibly could from time to time to give my body, my mind, mm. my soul, my spirit, everything just to refresh and regenerate, regenerate because science is now showing that if the more you loved your job, the more you need a break from it and mm. it helps just to regenerate and revitalise your passion and enthusiasm for it. A bit like kids, the more you love your kids, the more you need a break. And we're going to have to take a break because we have just gone way over time because you guys have been so awesome and we just want to thank you so, so much. I no love worries. you so much. I'm so proud and glad and happy that I've met you along the way and we've had some special moments together. This was another special moment. Andrew, this was your 55th interview for the last love week. It. And your best. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's been it's been great. Uh, great listening to Elaine's stories too. And uh, she's got uh, what she's been able to achieve. It's um, I feel humbled to be on the same screen as her. So oh, uh, very, very nice and uh, unbelievable trophy room. Have oh, a look at it. Pretty cool, isn't it? I love it. That is Brilliant. awesome. So awesome. <laughs> so uh, well done. And thanks for having me. Gary, and, and awesome, Lane, to, to uh, spend some time with you and get a look at all that great uh, hardware you've been able to find <laughs> along the way. So you too, Andrew. It's been awesome. Thank you. And thank Thanks, you, Kevin. guys. Thank you, Luke, for having us. Thank you, Lukey. Not a problem. Uh, just before we close off, please do make a donation to the Australian Sports Foundation. Uh, we are raising funds for them. So it's in the office area right now. We are supporting those local clubs for the next legendary athletes uh, to come through the ranks. 
Uh, thank you again for joining us. And uh, yeah, the room has been a buzz this morning. Kerry, nailed it. Nailed thanks, it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And we well are done. looking forward to tomorrow night. Duncan Armstrong, Emma Snowsill. So swimming Woo! in the platform tomorrow. Woo! I'll show you. See you later, everyone. See you guys. See Bye. you guys.